Do you guys ever have one of those weeks where absolutely nothing seems to go according to plan? Well, this week, welcome to my world. So the good news is I found a studio space and I'm really excited about it. I've already moved some of my stuff out there and I'm really excited to get rolling. And today I wanted to take you guys out there and do a little video tour. And as I was all set to do that, actually yesterday my car went in the shop for some servicing and it's still there. So it's kind of hard to take you on a video tour of the new space if we don't have a way to get there. So what I'm gonna have to do is sort some things around and uh, we're, today we're gonna talk about some photography exhibitions that I saw in LA. And then tomorrow we'll hopefully do the studio tour. So um, when I was in Los Angeles, Last week there were two incredible photography exhibitions, one at the Hammer and the one I was really impressed with is the one that's going on at the Getty right now. And as you guys know, the Getty is one of my favorite museums. Um, last time I was there I saw the Joseph Kudelka exhibition and this time around there was a show called Light Paper Process. So. We'll hold off, we'll do the studio tour tomorrow, and today we'll talk about some photography shows. Before we start talking about these two photography exhibitions, I do have a quick rant that I wanna get off my chest. Now the problem that I have with museums right now is the photography policy. And now I worked at a museum for seven years, so I fully understand what it is and why, but generally the rule of thumb is that you could photograph a museum's collection, but you can't photograph traveling exhibitions. The reason is it comes down to copyright, and it's the fact that the museum doesn't own pieces in the exhibition that's traveling. They're owned by other museums, sometimes they're owned by private collectors. But what I really wish would happen is I really wish that museums would start having a discussion about this when they sign the contract for the exhibition, because we're missing out on an incredible opportunity for people to share work that they enjoy on social media, tell their friends about it. It's a wonderful promotional opportunity, and more importantly, it's a reason to have a conversation about art and a conversation about photography, and that's what we're missing out on. Anyway, I'm sorry, rant over. I certainly could have called both of these institutions, told them about the show, and probably made arrangements to film there, but I didn't. And so what I'm doing is piecing this together by showing you stuff from their website and catalogs today. But anyway, that is my rant about museums. So now that we have that out of the way, I want to talk first about the Hammer Museum. Now right now at the Hammer Museum, there's an exhibit called Perfect Lightness Photography and Composition, uh, which is quite good and it features uh, a large number of photographers, including Andreas Gursky, Jeff Wall, Hiroshi Sugimoto, and many others. And what's interesting about this exhibition is the way that it displays how composition is approached through the medium of photography. Now, what's interesting about this is there's a counterpoint that exists here that challenges traditional notions of composition. And in the late 70s, there was a group of photographers who started to feel that overly composed images brought to mind uh, consumerism, uh, commercial photo shoots, probably a little bit of kitsch. And as a result, they started experimenting with what we perceive as composition. And so this covers everything uh, from highly conceptual works like the Sugimoto to overly posed portraits and even some images that start to question uh, what is actually reality in the composition where it looks like it's one thing and then you realize that the entire set's made out of cardboard, for instance. So there's some wonderful images in here and I like the way that it challenges our mindset uh, to what can be perceived as composition in photography. And I do recommend this exhibition. It is free right now, as is the other exhibition going on right now, which is Mark Bradford. And so if you're into uh, contemporary painters, I guess you could call him, although he doesn't necessarily use paint. Uh, Mark Bradford is a wonderful artist who incorporates elements of you know, found objects. Uh, sometimes it's labels, uh, sometimes it's trash. You don't realize this when you first see the composition. You see it from afar and it looks like an abstract painting. As you get closer, it reveals what the actual materials that the image is made of. Uh, Mark Bradford, I had the chance to work with years ago when I worked at the Dallas Museum of Art, and he is one hell of a nice guy. Uh, very little ego, and very deserving to be in the echelon that he operates in in the art world. Now, the second exhibition that I want to talk about was very special to me, and this was just, I think, very well done. This was called Light Paper Process Reinventing Photography. Uh, this is on at the J. Paul Getty Museum. I will link to the catalog that I've got here, as well as both of these exhibitions in the show notes, and I highly recommend you go check them out particularly this one. Light Paper Process is a celebration of the printed image. And I think this is a really interesting exhibition because it really explores all the possibilities and ideas that artists have had towards photography and print form. And this is a particularly interesting exhibition to have, I think, in today's world, because we're living in a world where uh, not just people who consider themselves photographers, but everyone has access to digital technology. You know, you have your cell phone, you take pictures of your kids, your vacation or whatever. And what is a digital file or a digital photograph? How does that exist? And what's interesting is this is a complete contrast to that, no pun intended, uh, in that when you have 
images that exist in print form, there is a possible intimacy and uniqueness that makes them very important. And the show did that so well. This is the catalog from the show, and I want to show this to you because it's very cool. So. The way this is put together, I'm pretty sure it's machine made, but the binding at least looks like it's hand-bound book um, held together by this piece of cardboard on the other side. Now there's a fancier version of this book that has things like a die cut on the Chris McCaw piece here um, that shows how the sun has literally torn through the image when you see this. And so this, uh, I, we don't have time to cover everything that's in the show. It was a wide range of styles, a wide range of aesthetic, a wide range of time, a wide range of ideas and concepts, but of what becomes art as an image in, exists in print form. And some of these are largely abstract. In fact, there is a layer of abstraction to all of the pieces that you see in the show. But I think that's what makes it really special. The other thing that you're gonna see a lot are little clever names for things like chemograms or, um, you know, people who are kind of playfully naming their process. Uh, Man Ray was one of the first photographers to do this when he used to call his variation on photograms rayograms. And there's some Man Ray in this exhibition as well, but it's a really nice spread of work and conceptual things that, that, that go on with, with working with the image. What is interesting is there is kind of a point here where you start to wonder and question the definition of what is photography. Because you can make an image, I mean, we all consider like a camera to be the general tool that you use for photography but that's not the only way you can create an image and manipulate light and get that onto a chemically coated piece of paper. And so if you're making images without the camera, um, you know, obviously something like a photogram is something most people are aware of. But when you get into some of these, what people are calling chemograms, where they're actually using things like electronic impulses or manipulations of the chemicals in the solution that's developing. Um, additional materials such as, uh, I remember one of these photographers was using nail polish. Uh, and even you see traces of like dust or dirt in the actual solution too that affect the overall image. And these do get so abstract at one point you start to wonder at what point is it no longer photography and it's somebody who's painting with chemicals and light but then again you think what is painting with chemicals and light well that's photography by definition so anyway I think it challenged um, for me as a visitor anyway or as a viewer it challenged a lot of how we perceive photography to be the one thread that I keep iterating though that I thought made this exhibition so special was the thread of all these works being essentially one of a kinds and if you consider photography as a medium that largely for years has been designed for replication. So the whole concept of making images on negatives and being able to use the darkroom to consistently print those and digital works like this as well, it's designed to be replicated. And then when you have people that are making images that are designed to be one of a kind, it's a very different feel and a very different quality that comes in with that work. And I think it's absolutely amazing. Now, I only have time to show you a few people in here and I wanna show you the two highlights for me. And these were two of the cornerstone photographers in this exhibition that works were up in the large room at the back wall. And one of them is Lisa Oppenheim, the other is Chris McCaw. And I wanna talk about Lisa's work first. Now Lisa does some highly conceptual work it's extremely interesting. She's a younger photographer working today. And there's two series in here. One of them she refers to as heliograms and the other one she refers to as lunogram, lunograms. And these are really interesting the way they're laid out. And you can see this is how they're displayed on the wall. They're not little thumbnail size. These, each one of these is about a foot square. And this first image was, she did not do the source image. So there's a kind of a collaborative historical element to these. The source images in these heliograms or these sun images was essentially a portrait of the sun that was taken in 1876 that was, lives at the American Museum of Natural History. She used this negative as her source and she made a series of basically uh, sun printed images for lack of a better way of explaining it where she used a dark box and she would put this negative in and expose these um, for a series of days and so you have almost a calendar on this grid here and she tried to keep them as consistent as possible. Now things happen when you're, when you're using the sun as the light source, um, solarization of the image when it gets too bright, um, inconsistencies that you have with things like cloud coverage. And so she tried to keep these as consistent as possible, I assume, but there is a lot of differential between them. Now there are missing holes in here in this pattern. These indicate the days where she couldn't get a print. And so overcast weather, uh, rainy weather, something like that where the sun was obscured. What I find interesting about this series though is that she has a historical tie-in, that it's a collaborative work with a, with a photographer who took the original image. Um, she makes no bones about that, but her work is the series of prints that are done in collaboration with that image. It is an image of the sun 
exposed by the sun. So in, in essence, you become a self-portrait of what's going on here. And especially when you include this calendar type of grid that accounts for days that, that a print was not able to be made. I thought that was particularly interesting and, and I thought very clever and, and wonderfully conceptual. She did another series that was very similar. These were, um, uh, it was, the source image was a picture of the moon, or a series of pictures of the moon that were made by an astronomer at NYU. And his name is escaping me, but I'll put it in the show notes. Anyway, these are dated around 1850 or so. So again, that historical tie-in. This time she made them um, using phases of the moon and using moonlight to expose the image. So once again, you get that self-portrait quality to it. And some of these just are just, there's a creepy, nostalgic, I just think they're absolutely brilliant uh, quality to these. And when they're displayed in a series like this, and these are each, eh, they're a little bigger too, uh, 19 inches by 15 inches or so. And uh, I think she just does some amazing work. Um, before we close this out, I want to talk about Chris McCall. Now, I have done a whole video on Chris McCall. I did that earlier this year, and I'll link that up as well. Um, so you guys, if you've seen that, you're probably familiar with his work. Um, in a nutshell, Chris has these homemade cameras that he takes out and does these day-long exposures of the sun. He prints them directly onto expired photo paper that's really large. And so some of these are, are absolutely huge, and I'll get into that in a second. So what you're going to see is a passage of time. And literally, in a lot of these cases, the sun will, as it moves across the sky, as you can see in this one, it not only will solarize the image, is what you're seeing here, this real dark quality to it that kind of starts turning it into a positive, somewhere between a positive and a negative, but also burns a hole literally into the paper. I mean, these things catch fire when he's taking exposure. He'll be out sitting with the camera sometimes an entire day and sometimes a few hours. It just depends on the image and what he's doing. And Chris does amazing stuff. And what's interesting is since I've done that episode, there's a interview that I saw with Chris where he was talking about his compositional approach and the fact that whatever he shoots, compositionally that happens to be in the picture with the sun ends up being backlit. Obviously, you're not going to shoot anything behind the sun. And so everything he has is basically a silhouette and how that impacts his approach to composition. It has a moody feel to it. It has a very nostalgic vibe to it, especially when they start to solarize. So there's that historical quality that comes back into what Chris is doing with homemade cameras. Um, this was the centerpiece of the exhibition. It was against the back wall. And this is a series of works that were taken, you know, in an entire phase during the day of the sun moving across the horizon at a specific time of the year. And these are each... Uh, let's see, 40 by 30 inches, so they're, they're fairly large. And to see these in person, I mean, you cannot reproduce these in a book or in a video or on the internet that's going to be in the same way. And that's what I meant by a lot of these works are very unique. They're not replicable. And I think that's what makes them special. Chris's newer work is he's experimenting on this basic theme and he's doing stuff where he's doing multiple exposures where the sun crosses at different days. And again, literally burning the paper. And uh, you can see right through to the back of the frame. And these are really marvelous. And then this is also interesting too, um, where Chris has started to work with multiple lenses. And so what he does is takes a very large sheet of paper. And when you look at these from across the room, they look like small circles with lines rolling through them. But as you get closer and read the label, you discover that this is a lens board was made for this camera that had 63 lenses in it. And I think that they're all Pentax 50 millimeters, I want to say. And so having different lenses allows him to vary the exposure for the pattern. It allows him to close certain lenses and expose two different directions of the sun, which is what he's done here. And to start working with these, it kind of looks like a bug's eye with these you know, macro images that you're looking at. When you get close, you realize each one of them is one of those sun portraits that he does. And they're just absolutely beautiful, um, the way this is handled. And I think it's really interesting what he's doing with experimenting with his whole setup of printing directly to the paper where you can do things with multiple lenses, um, you know, all that stuff. Anyway, I will link up to these exhibitions. I wish I could talk all day about this because we didn't even get to a lot of these color images. Um, this guy, John Chiara, is amazing too, the way he does these really wonderful, moody, uh, images with basically a camera that's a trailer that mounts to his car and what he does to get these. And these are color too, which is equally impressive. Anyway, wonderful exhibition. Go check out the catalog. It's not an expensive book um, and it's well worth having. There are technical notes on the processes in here. They really did a nice job. It's not just a catalog that rants on and on about, you know, the relevance of history and the place of the modern artist. I mean, they tell you how these are done and, and, and what some of the techniques are and it's absolutely wonderful. So anyway, that is Light Paper Process. Reinvent Photography, go see it. 
I want to take a second and give a shout out to our sponsor today, who are the awesome folks over at lynda.com. If you're not familiar with lynda.com, they offer one of the most extensive video training libraries that you're going to find anywhere on the internet. The core of their library is creative based. So if you're interested in graphic design, illustration, they have titles on photography and videography. And if you want to expand your knowledge of whatever it is that you're into, Lynda probably has something that's right for you. I've been a subscriber to lynda.com since long before I had this show, and they've always been a great resource for me and so I'm really excited that they're now a sponsor of the show. They have a deal right now for Art of Photography viewers where you can check out the entire website absolutely free for 10 days and what you want to do is go to the special link that I'm going to give you. You want to head over to lynda.com slash AOP. That is lynda with a y dot com slash AOP. That lets lynda know that I sent you and you're going to get 10 days of free unlimited access to the entire website. So head over there. They've got a title on learning how to print and analog photography so go check out the videos and see if you can learn something new. Anyway, once again, I want to give a special shout out to lynda.com and thank them for once again sponsoring another episode of The Art of Photography. Hopefully we will get to do the tour of the new studio in the next show or two here. I'm really excited about it, something I've been working behind the scenes on. You've probably noticed that I've changed the production up quite a bit in the last couple shows and it's something I'm really trying to take this show to another level with. So there's a lot of cool stuff in the works. I've got my episode on John Free that I'm still editing. I will try to post a release date on that in the next couple days. Um, I, I didn't want to release that too soon because it really needs to be special. John did a great job on that and I think it's really going to be a lot of fun. Um, anyway, as always, if you guys enjoyed this episode, please remember to like it and share it with your friends and as always subscribe hit the subscribe button it helps you it helps me and you will stay up to date on all the latest and greatest videos that we do here on the art of photography until the next video I'll see you later